Matthew's theme in the book of Matthew is uh, Jesus as the King in the Kingdom of God. And so when you read the book of Matthew, you're going to find a whole lot of Old Testament references. You're going to find him talking a lot about Jesus being the Messiah. He's written the book to Jewish people to help them understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And, and there's a lot in there about the Kingdom of God and life in the Kingdom of God. If you were uh, a Jewish person 2,000 years ago, back when Matthew was re, uh, writing his gospel, this is what you would have believed about the Kingdom of God. First of all, you would believe that there is a coming Messiah, that God's going to establish His Kingdom under a Messiah. That Messiah will be a physical Messiah. He's going to be uh, born uh, in a, either royalty or a very uh, high-class home. He's going to have the best education. He's going to be a military and political leader. He's going to gain an army and push Rome and the Roman Empire out of Israel. He's going to restore Israel to the days of King David, and he's going to sit on that throne in Jerusalem. And so when you're talking about the Messiah, and we know 2,000 years later, that Matthew's talking about a, a spiritual Messiah and a spiritual kingdom. But, but in those days, no one believed that. Every Jewish person is believing in a physical Messiah setting up a physical kingdom. Here's what they knew about that kingdom. That kingdom was going to be comprised of Jewish people. Your entrance into the kingdom is based on two things. One, uh, your heritage as a Jewish person, the blood flowing through your veins as a, as a Jewish person, and then number two, your strict adherence to the law. So that meant also that they knew exactly who wasn't going to be a part of the kingdom. Number one, there's going to be no Gentiles in the, in, in the kingdom of God because it was for Jews only. Second, you're not going to have uh, the weak, you're not going to have the sick, you're not going to have uh, people uh, that are disobedient because uh, their sin and their, their lack of adherence to the law keeps them out of the kingdom of God. So it's going to be basically successful, um, good, law-keeping Jewish people. That's the kingdom of God. And in fact, they even talked about this messianic banquet that that when someday as the kingdom goes along, there's going to be at the end of times this great banquet that the Messiah is going to hold, and the table is going to be filled with Jewish people that are strong, that, that are uh, rule keepers, and that's going to be who's going to be in the kingdom. And so uh, that is their understanding. So I want you to keep that in mind as I read the stories out of Matthew chapter 8 because Matthew's going to do a masterful job in Matthew 8 of arranging some stories to talk about the kingdom of God, who's in the kingdom of God, and the role faith plays in the kingdom of God. And, and it's just interesting how he put these together. So uh, all of chapter 8, by the way, is basically one day in the life of Jesus. So we're going to start with a couple of stories out of Matthew chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. And going through verse 13, there's two stories that I'll tell here. Story number one is a man who has leprosy. Matthew 8, 1. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, I just want to kind of go back and, and fill in the gaps here on, on the, what he is saying. Here's a man with leprosy who came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. A person who had leprosy in that culture, first of all, the, the religious leaders believed that you had leprosy because there was a sin in your life. And so leprosy was tied to sin, and so certainly they would not be a part of the kingdom. Leprosy was a disease that would ultimately end in death. It was, uh, it was uh, you, could, you could catch leprosy, uh, and so they uh, excommunicated them from the temple and they actually quarantined them outside the walls of the city, and they were to live basically in a little encampment all by themselves. 
They had no uh, political life. They had no social life. They had no uh, spiritual life. They were seen as the ultimate nobodies. Nobody cared. Nobody wanted them around. People were scared to death of them. Leprosy in that day was a death sentence because they knew at some point, uh, because of the way the nerve endings died around their fingers and toes, they would hit something, they would break something, infection would set in and they would die. And like I said, they, the people in the community believed that the lepers were lepers because of sin in their lives. And so these are the ultimate outsiders. Now they couldn't come into the city and they couldn't be around crowds because uh, if they were and touched someone, the penalty for that was death by stoning. And so a leper had to keep his distance from everyone because he couldn't have physical contact with people. That's very, very important to understand this story. So he came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So either this leper uh, slipped through the crowds because there were heavy crowds here, or he waited till Jesus was separated from the crowds a little bit and approached Jesus when there was when there's a little separation between he and the crowds. We don't know which one, but somehow the leper got to Jesus and was right in front of him. That would have been highly unusual and highly offensive to all the crowds that were standing there. Second of all, um, somehow this leper had either heard enough stories about Jesus or had seen a healing himself. Maybe Jesus had healed another leper that, that he knew, but somehow he knew that Jesus was able to heal him. And, and what I want you to notice here, he says, came and knelt before him. Think about what kneeling would mean in that culture. Kneeling would mean submission to authority. So he's kneeling before Jesus, giving him that authority, and he called him Lord, which means master, or think about what Matthew is showing. He believes he's the Messiah. He's saying, Messiah, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I am not doubting the power of God at all in you, Jesus. I, I believe it. I'm kneeling before you. I call you Lord. I'm submitting to you. I believe you're the Messiah. I know you can heal. The only question I know that's up for, for grabs here, Jesus, is are you willing? Are you willing to make me clean? Because I, I know enough about you to know who you are and that you will make me clean if that's your will. And so Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Now remember, what could you not do to a leper? You couldn't touch him, nor could he touch you. And if you ever touched him, you would, make, you would become unclean. I think this is very significant in this story because lepers would touch people and make them unclean, but not with the Son of God. With Jesus, Jesus touched the leper, and instead of the leper making him unclean, he made the leper clean. He touched him and healed him. Think about how many years potentially it had been since someone had touched that man. And Jesus, compassion, that's his motive, compassion, touches that man, says, I am willing, be clean, touches him, and he's healed. Then Jesus said to him, don't go tell anyone. The reason is, is, is Jesus has three years to do this ministry. He can't have these stories get out and there'll be too much of a frenzy because he can't have the Pharisees attack him too early. He's got three years to go before, before he's going to die on a cross on Passover. And so he's got to really control uh, the ministry from the standpoint of who finds out what, who does what. Uh, and so he, he was careful up front. He'll do this again in chapter 9 of telling people, just don't, just don't go talk a lot about this miracle. Just let it be what it is. And then if you'll notice here, he says, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony of Jesus. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, as a testimony to them. It's interesting to me how the Pharisees always blame Jesus for breaking the law. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus never broke the law. Jesus just broke the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. Jesus wrote the law. I mean, he's God. He wrote the law of Moses, so he never broke his own law. But here's what he does here. When he heals this leper, there's very specific instructions in the law that if, if a leper did get well instead of dying, there were certain things he was to do. He was supposed to go back into to town and basically get the priest to sign off on the fact that he was healed and then make a sacrifice for that healing. 
And so Jesus says, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and follow the law and do what the law has asked you to do. So Jesus is upholding the law. Matthew chapter 6, he says he's come to fulfill the law. That's what we're talking about. He's fulfilling. He's, he's obeying. He doesn't walk in rebellion to the law. So that's the first story, and it's a story of amazing faith of a guy that's a complete outcast that shouldn't have faith, that does, and Jesus always responds to faith with favor, and so Jesus healed him because of his faith. Now, here is the second story, beginning in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Now I'm going to stop right here and once again set some context. Remember that banquet I was telling you about a few minutes ago? The Jews were very clear who was and wasn't going to be in the banquet. And one of the people that wasn't going to be in the banquet is someone with leprosy. But certainly there were going to be no Gentiles at the banquet, right? Well, the first guy that, that Jesus healed in Matthew chapter 8 that Matthew's making the point of is, was an outsider that would never be a part of that banquet. The second one is, is a Gentile. But interestingly enough, not just any Gentile, but a Roman officer, a centurion, a Roman officer. That means he's going to be very well connected. He's probably pretty wealthy. <clears throat> he, is, um, he is kind. He's considerate. His uh, servant probably is a Jewish person because most of the Roman officers, they hired Jews to be their slaves. Uh, this, is a, this is a very important man in the Roman Empire. And think about what is on the line for him. What could he lose by coming to Jesus? Is if, his, if his commanding officer finds out, if his men find out that he comes, and did you notice what he did? He came and asked for help. He also believed Jesus was the Messiah. He also called Him Lord in verse 6. So he's saying, Jesus, I know who you are. You're the Lord. And in fact, <clears throat> he kneeled down before Him. Here's a centurion Roman officer kneeling before a Jewish man, calling Him Lord, Master, Messiah, saying, I know you can help my servant. Would you heal my servant? He's, and so Jesus said, do you want me to come with you? you want me to come with you to heal your servant? And here's what the man says. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell you this, go, and he goes. And I tell that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So I want you to understand what the centurion's saying here. He's saying, I know that you're the Messiah. I know that you have power to heal my servant. I know and I recognize authority when I see it. And I know you have authority over me. That's why I called you Lord. That's why I'm asking you for your help. And I understand authority because I'm a Roman officer. I have a commanding officer that tells me what to do. And I have people under me and I tell them what to do. And you know what? I don't have to go with them and be in their presence to watch them do it. All I have to do is say the word and speak it and they do it because that's how authority works. And as much authority as I have, you have more. In fact, you have authority over me. That's why I called you Lord. And so no, you don't have to come see my servant. All you have to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. Here's what Jesus said. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those who were following him, who were those who were following him? Jewish people. He says, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now I want you to think about what a slap in the face that is to the Jewish people. I mean, Jesus is a Jew. He's ministering among Jewish people. The followers, all of these followers that are following Him are Jewish people. Everywhere Jesus went, there were Pharisees there that were watching everything He did. And yet, what does Jesus do? Jesus says, you see this Gentile right here? 
This is the most faith I've seen in my ministry thus far. This man has more faith than anyone I've seen in Israel up to this date. Remember who else is standing there? His disciples. And yet that's what he says. And then he says this, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is he saying there? He's looking at the Jewish people. He's looking at the Pharisees that are out there behind the crowds. And he's saying, listen, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And by the way, that messianic banquet you're talking about that you think is going to be based on bloodlines and obeying the law, let me tell you how you punch your ticket to the end of the age's messianic feast. You punch your ticket through faith. And there's going to be a lot of Gentiles around that table. And there's going to be some lepers around that table. And they're there for one reason. They have great faith. And there's going to be a lot of Jewish people, even Jewish people in some really powerful positions in Israel. And they're not going to be around the table. In fact, they're going to be where? In outer darkness we know as hell, right? They're going to be in hell. They're not going to be with the Messiah at the end of days. You know why? Because it's not about your bloodline. And it's not about your family status. And it's not about your observance of the law. It's about your heart. It's about your faith. That's what enters, gets you to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus, in this one story, turns their whole world upside down. Yes, there's going to be an end of the world banquet. But let me tell you something. It's going to be an end-of-the-world banquet based on faith, not based on which church you go to. And then he ends this by saying, And then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believe it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment. And so Jesus heals the servant of the centurion by not going to the house. He just spoke the word. He just spoke the word and the servant was healed. That reminds me of what? Creation. Right? All, all God did, Jesus did, was speak, and the earth was created. Here He just speaks, and the servant is healed. And this is a foreshadowing to the end of the chapter, because this is going to happen again in the next story. So if you're to read on in the rest of uh, chapter 8, what you would find is Jesus does some other healings. He, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Um, he does some teaching. There's several things He does in chapter 8. It is a long day. A very long day. And when he gets to the end of that day, he is tired. He's exhausted and wants to get away. And so he gets on the boat with his uh, 12 disciples, and they go out in the boat to go across the lake to just get away from the crowds and give Jesus some rest. So here's what happens. 8.23, Matthew 8.23. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke Him saying, Lord, save us. Don't you care if we drown? He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then He got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey Him. Now, don't miss the irony here. Matthew at the beginning of the chapter sets up these stories of here's two people who should never have faith. A leper and a centurion. They had great faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Of everybody in Israel, who should have the most faith? How about the 12 guys that hang out with Jesus all the time? How about the guys that eat with Him and sleep next to Him at night? And, and walk with Him and have seen every single miracle He has performed. How about those guys? Those guys should be the guys that have faith, right? And by the way, Matthew is one of those guys. But Matthew, at the end of this chapter, is, is taking and showing you that the people in the kingdom of God who you think wouldn't have faith do, and the people who you think would have faith, sometimes they don't. 
So he says, let me tell you this story. We went out on the lake. Jesus falls asleep because he's tired. A huge storm comes up so big that it was coming over the boat. We were going to capsize and drown. And so you know what we did? We went and woke Jesus up and says, Jesus, what are you doing? Don't you care if we drown? We're questioning Jesus' motives. We're questioning his power. We're saying, what in the world are you doing here, Jesus? You're just going to let us drown? Like Jesus has come all this way to start this ministry to die on a lake in the middle of a storm. And so what does Jesus say to them? You of little faith. Don't you remember the centurion this morning and the healing of that girl? Don't you remember I could just change things at the, at the speak of a word? Do you not remember the leper? Peter, do you not remember me healing your mother-in-law? You really think I'm going to come out here and we're going to die in a storm? Oh, you of little faith. Where is your faith? You're the guys that should have faith. And then he stands up and simply speaks. And the winds and the waves calm. Not only does Jesus have authority over physical uh, healing, but he has authority over nature. And at the simple speak of the word, and everything is calm. Now notice, the centurion and the leper called Jesus Lord. What are they saying? We know exactly who you are. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. Notice what the disciples say at the end of this. It says, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. They're, they're, they're not sure yet that he's the Messiah. So here's two People who should not have faith at all, they're believing in the Messiah. Here's guys that should know exactly who He is and they can't figure it out. And that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. Sometimes the people that appear to have it all together, they have no idea what they're talking about because they don't believe. They don't have a heart for God. And other people who you think are rough around the edges and would never be qualified for the kingdom, well, they're right in the center of the Messianic banquet for one reason. They have faith in Jesus Christ. So here's your takeaway for today. I am encouraged by these stories, and here's why I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because there's nobody beyond the kingdom of God. Everyone is eligible. Anyone is, the outcast is eligible, the Roman centurion who represents uh, the wealthy and the privileged, royalty, they're in the kingdom of God. The normal disciples, they're all eligible for the kingdom of God. Who gets in? Just the guy or girl that has faith. That's all Jesus is looking for. That's the ticket that gets you into the banquet. And here's the great news. Sometimes my faith fails me. Has your faith ever failed you? The disciples' faith failed them here. But that wasn't the end of the story, was it? Because, by the way, they fail again and again and again, but they keep failing forward. And by the time Jesus is resurrected and ascends into heaven, it's those 12 guys that start a revolution that changes the world. So when our faith fails us, it doesn't mean the story is over and we're done. It just means that God's going to give us other opportunities to, to uh, fail or to succeed in our faith and grow in our faith. So when the biggest tests in life comes, we're ready for them. And so I want you to be encouraged by the fact that just because you haven't done faith perfectly in the past, and maybe even now you've failed, it doesn't mean it's failure forever. As long as you have breath in your lungs, the next move forward is just a faith move. And God will honor that and you'll see His power, and you'll see His healing, and you'll see Him preparing you for something great in your life because that's life in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank You for our time in the Word today. And Lord, I just, I just pray that uh, these words, even through my inability to speak eloquently, that these words land in people's hearts and they create life change. Lord, may we be encouraged by the failure of the disciples here knowing that you, don't give up, you didn't give up on them and you don't give up on us. And our failures doesn't mean that we're failures. It just means that you're gonna give us another opportunity 
to move forward in our faith. Thank you for that, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great day.